Now, Snowden points the finger at President Obama, but how could U.S. companies possibly resist national security laws? You're now a CNBC contributor, former Clinton White House aide Keith Boykin. Heather Higgins, President and CEO of Independent Women's Voice, and Peter Brooks, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, and now a Heritage Foundation Senior Fellow. Actually, Heather, if I understand this, in terms of federal national security requests, what Michael Hayden told us yesterday, former NSA head, they had 300 last year. 300. All part of kajillions of collections. 300. Big deal. Yeah, the, the number of actual... Part of what Snowden did was when he first spoke about this, he made it sound as though they were listening in on phone calls. They weren't. They were looking at metadata, the same metadata which has been commercially available for sorting out and deciding which ads you're going to receive um, or what better plan you're going to be offered. Uh, the, there's a great piece by Gordon Krovitz today walking through all of the aspects of this that have been legal and publicly discussed for years that have survived ACLU challenges in right. courts, etc. Um, and contrasting the decision, for example, of Cambridge not to turn on the surveillance cameras uh, and so not look at the bits of data that, that really are public information. People forget that this information, that this is not a private phone call that they're having in, in terms of they, the fact that they're they having They don't it. even, the federal, the NSA part doesn't even go after cell towers. No. That's a local law enforcement. They could if they wanted to, but they don't. Now, are, are you going to defend Snowden? Where do you come out on this? I'm very interested to hear your take. Well, you know, I think there's been a dissolution of the, of the whole notion of privacy in our country. I think about myself, if I, everybody knows this, if, if I go online, Facebook knows my entire family, Twitter knows my entire political beliefs, and Google knows everything about my health history, because I always type it in to find out what, what, what might be wrong with me if something goes, 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 goes awry. But I think there's this larger problem here with this guy Snowden. I think he's got this whole sort of, of messianic complex or martyr syndrome and he's portrayed himself in such sanctimonious terms so he is the defender of all liberty and the reality is that a lot of these claims like Heather pointed out have been out in public for a long time yep. even though I do think there is a, a legitimate reason for him to be a whistleblower and to protect whistleblowers he if he is really responsible for what he if he really believes in what he's saying he should take the responsibility and come and, and, and allow himself to be extradited of course he won't do that because there's more to this story we're going to learn um, Peter Brooks, you know, I, I'm going to give President Obama high marks on this, okay? I know he changed his mind after the campaign and so forth years ago. But uh, he's on Charlie Rose. Uh, it's an interview that's going to run tonight. Uh, I read some of the experts. He's hanging tough. He basically is saying what uh, uh, former NSA head Michael Hayden said yesterday on the news. There's a big difference between collection and content. And something else I want you to comment on. President Obama said, look, there are trade-offs in life. There are all kinds of trade-offs in life. And he just named a couple. Airports and drunken drivers. Those are two very interesting, uh, two very interesting examples of that. I give Obama credit. Do you? Yeah, I mean, he was mugged by reality from his uh, days when he was campaigning and to when he became president, and he saw what the world was really all about and the challenges we face from terrorism. You know, Larry, tomorrow is going to be really telling as well, besides what the president says tonight, because General Alexander, the director of NSA, is going to testify in an unusual public hearing. And what I'm hearing here in Washington is that he's going to tell us that this, has, this program has stopped dozens of terror plots in more than 20 countries. Now, I don't know if I'll be made a liar tomorrow morning by the, by the sunrise, but that's pretty significant. How specific, Peter? Well, I mean, I don't know how much what he's going to tell us. That's probably what they're going through. In fact, I heard he was going to talk today, but they're probably scrubbing the information because they don't want to give away any more sensitive intelligence sources and methods. Enough has been exposed already that undermines our national security. So they're probably very carefully going through this, talking with people within the intelligence community to see what they can tell the American people. The unfortunate part about this, Larry, of course, is the fact that it comes amidst the bungling of Benghazi, right. and you know, the rifling of reporters' emails, and of course the IRS well, the scandal. IRS. So it couldn't yeah. have been it couldn't have been planned worse because right. everybody lost confidence in the IRS, which has been politicized and is corrupt. But that's a far cry from the NSA. Uh, Heather Higgins Richardson. I, Heather Richardson Higgins. I beg your pardon. Right, um, right. Seriously, the role of Apple, the role of Google. The
the role of Facebook. Why shouldn't they cooperate with U.S. state and local laws, in particular national security laws? I don't understand the logic uh, about that. They, they actually should. And in fact, one of the places where Snowden went wrong is even if you think that there is far too much that is classified in our country and there's far too much protection of trivia and persecution of people for releasing things that are not actually material, the reality is, is that there would have been other ways for him to handle it. And more importantly, nobody elected him to make that decision. There is a collective project here, and he seemed to have forgotten that this is a team effort. Um, in, and he was not the accountable representative our president is, our elected right. representatives are. He is not. And he has secondly caused real harm to our intelligence collection efforts, which actually matter. Because the bad guys probably didn't know near as much as they're learning. Not only how that. sophisticated where, when, why, and how. Is that fair? That is fair. Moreover, our allies are now starting to say, why the heck should we ever trust you with anything? We, we know that you've got these people there who, part of the problem is, is that in the 1990s, we totally changed the standards for who could work on sensitive information and classified programs. And anybody, it used to be this Cold War mentality, if you had a weakness, if you had, you know, a psychological messianic complex, as you put it, I think he's just a but narcissist who's gone all the way on that the self-esteem moment. But Keith, that's why I don't regard him as a whistleblower. I regard him as a traitor. I, I don't think he's a traitor. I don't think he's a hero. I think he's somewhere in, in Why between. Why isn't he a traitor? Well, I think he... For all the things I, that Heather I, just I walked through. I think he thinks that... For there I think, to be treason, there needs to be war. And there's no actual war right now. Well, but there's he, an undeclared war. There's it's a terrorist war. I, 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 just, I just... I think we should back away from all the, the, the harsh language and just focus on what he's done. But the, the most important point he's making is that no one is above the law. I agree with him. Which means that he, too, is not above right. the law. So he has a responsibility means, to turn himself... By the way, back. that is correct. That's a great point. He, too. And that includes Google. And that includes Microsoft, and the president that of the United includes States. Facebook, that includes the president, that includes everybody in this table, in this panel. That's exactly right. People should get that. Anyway, I'll say this. I'm glad the president is out there now defending this. The first we've heard from him, and that's a very good thing. And uh, I hope he stays with it. Peter Brooks, thank you very much for thank filling you. us in. We appreciate it. Keith and Heather are going to join us later on. All right, Supreme Court ruled today that the FTC can keep challenging something called pay to delay. Those are deals between pharmaceutical companies and the generic drug makers. But the court stopped short of declaring the deals illegal altogether. Now, question, do these deals help provide the necessary incentives for vital research and development, or do they just get in the way of the free market making drugs affordable for consumers? Tough question. Let's ask our panel. CNBC contributor, former Clinton White House aide Keith Boykin, Heather Higgins, president and CEO of Independent Women's Voice, and we bring back Doug Holtz Eakin, president of American Action Forum, and former Congressional Budget Office Director. We actually bring back all three of you. What do you think of this, Heather? I think it's, it's complex. People need to understand that this occurs where there is a drug that has a patent. A generic manufacturer looks for ways to go around the patent and say that the patent is flawed. That then means that the drug company gets into litigation to defend their patent, and then because both sides are looking at this enormously expensive lawsuit, they settle. And the generic maker gets to make a drug a little bit sooner, which benefits patients, but the drug company gets to preserve at least some of the life of its patent that it was expecting. The challenge to this is it's not going to be good for consumers because right. it means that you have less incentive to settle. It's a reflection of one of the ongoing themes of the problem that I see, which is that we constantly create uncertainty for business. Um, you, there's no point settling because that might immediately put you into a right, right there. The what do you think of that, Keith? I completely disagree with almost everything she said. I think it is good for consumers. It does actually create some certainty. But the settlement is good for consumers. Well, well the, the, decision, the decision from the court today, right. it was the FTC decision, was good for consumers. It doesn't say that the, 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 the drug manufacturers have to. To negotiate deals, but if they are, the court you can actually sue, and dis, and the courts get to decide in which cases the, the the deals that they're making are appropriate, in which cases they're not. The reason why this is good for good for consumers, Larry, the big pharmaceutical companies have for many years had a cabal that's basically tried to prevent the drug company drug prices from going down. But we the patents were cut back. Well, but, the, 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 to Heather's point, the patents were that's the private property issue in this. The patents were cut back. You still back. have the right you, to you have the patents though under this decision. Though. You I have a patent. I understand. You got to have a patent, but they were cut back. This is never going to be clear cut because patents themselves are not necessarily good for consumers. They allow monopolies to persist for long periods of time, but 
they allow the drugs to be developed to begin with. So you're always balancing these, these two pieces of the economic uh, play field. So okay. What bothers me about this is the court is stepping in and saying, we are well positioned to decide the balance between innovation and how long a monopoly persists. And those parties that were actually in the settlement who looked at the, 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 the competitive playing field and came to a deal are not well positioned. That's just backwards. Right. You should the, the, the respect the that decision. The judicial out. process can look at it and, and those people can The decide. lawyers are going to get rich. The consumers may be screwed. Yeah. The lawyers the are going to get rich. The consumers always get screwed. Right, stay with me. The lawyers <laughs> always get rich. Wait, Moody's, <laughs> I, got a bet, I got another one for you. It's really free market. <laughs> Moody's calls Detroit's new restructuring and default plan an historic move. Me too. Absolutely. Ten cents on the dollar and unions will get the same treatment as tax-free municipal bondholders and pensioners. The pain will be spread in Motown, which is going bankrupt. That's next on Cudlow. Okay, Detroit emergency manager Kevin Orr, my new hero, is going to offer bondholders, unions, and pensioners 10 cents on the dollar to save Detroit City's finances. Tax-free municipal bondholders, you may well be part of this because the next step is going to be Chapter 9 bankruptcy and then everything will be off the table and every single contract will be broken. I think this is tough stuff. I want to go to my panel to get some wisdom on that, Heather Higgins. I think one of the problems that we've had, and you look at the states and the localities, that have been spending money like drunken sailors. That's right. And they do it in part because they're subsidized by effectively unrestricted access to capital markets. And the, the credit holders don't really care how awfully these cities are managed and how much money they spend and their ridiculous pension deals that are just feather bedded and that there's this assumption that they can just spend money and, indefinitely and, without well, cost. And the unions, the pensioners are going to get 10 cents on the dollar, the health care guys are going to get 10 cents, or if they, don't, if they say no, then you go into court and Chapter 9 and every single contract will be completely broken. Well, the Michigan Constitution forbids them from impairing these contractual obligations with the pension holders, so they're going to have to figure out you a way. Don't the, the, really the Michigan believe Constitution. that that will be enforced? Well, of course, if you want to have federal law trump the local state law, then you don't have to worry about that, I but know. I thought conservatives didn't like that. I usually don't, <laughs> but in this case, I, the, the, the gig is up. But, the gig but, is up. But Detroit you know, has been bankrupt for, I don't know, 40, I, I, 50 years. So Larry, I, gig is up. It's, it's been run by the it's, liberals it's, since 61. Where is the workers' power? There was, there was, there was a, a workers' paradise. Worker, there was a story in the Detroit Free Press just the other day about this 77-year-old man who worked for the city of Detroit for 32 years. He gets $800 a I month of his pension. That's what he depends well, on. You're going to tell him he has to no, survive I, off of. I hate that part. I agree with you, but. His own union leadership is yes. to blame. They They're the ones that screwed him. Go ahead, Doug. Holtz. Well, I mean, this is cleaning up the mess of the past, and this is a good way to clean it up, and, and God bless him if he gets it done, but it doesn't fix the future. And, and if he can get a functional economy underneath the city of Detroit, they'll have a chance in the future. That means very different policies going forward, lower taxes. That's uh, what, but that's what Orr said. Spending. That's what Orr and, wants to do. And if he, he gets, wants to get rid of these liabilities and get rid of these debt and take his cash flow and Fix start cutting economy. tax rates right. and have better public safety, make the street lights and lamps work for and a change. And if he gets it all done, what's he do next? Greece. Sign him up. I, I think Greece. Greece. <laughs> take care of the people before you take See, the I, ha the look, I, hate, I, I hate the no, fact have, that the pensioners have, are getting You have screwed. to put everybody that. in. That's you, the first rule. But, uh, but the I, union leadership did this time and time again. In, this, in Michigan yes. particularly and Detroit particularly, the unions were so strong, the UAW, etc. They're the ones who, they should hang them but, up. But is this, is this, is this the campaign about up. destroying unions or about, or about restoring the, the fiscal integrity of Detroit? I mean, yes. I think this is a good excuse for the conservatives to go after Change is in the air. Change is in the air. Go to the wall and Michigan. stop the change. That's your job. Keith Boyd, thank no. you. Heather Higgins, thank you very much. Doug Holtzikin, that's it for tonight's show. We appreciate it. Tomorrow